Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is the first Sunday of the Blessed Month Patur, and we're going to be familiar with this parable of the sower from this week and next Sunday as well. And our Lord, in his description of this parable, he says there's four responses to the word of God. And we have to be clear that the reference here is towards the Holy Scripture. So ultimately, it points to our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so the first response is you might hear the word of God and you simply don't believe. And it's as simple as straightforward as that. It reminds us that not all people respond positively to the word of God. It's a matter of faith, not just any faith. The second response, you hear the word of God and you believe for a little while and then you fall into temptation and ultimately fall away. So the word of God didn't find deep soil to grow deep roots, strong roots. And so the faith is weak and the roots were even weaker. The third response, you hear the word of God, you believe, but then you let everything else in life choke out your love for the word. The word of God fell in soil that was sufficient, but it was also filled with weeds. And the faith and the roots were somewhat healthy, and the weeds took their strength and nutrition over time. It took over. The fourth response, you hear the word of God, you keep it with an honest and good heart, until you bear fruit. Ultimately, ultimately, our Lord Jesus Christ is not necessarily interested in agriculture or farming or anything like this, but he's really concerned with the condition of our hearts. That's what this parable is all about. It's the condition of your heart. And we have questions that we have to think about. Is the heart serious about knowing God and keeping his word? We have to be honest with ourselves. We don't want to just go through the motions. Is the heart mediocre and, and like lukewarm in its application to the faith? Is the heart free and clear from thorns and weeds that will later choke out the life of that little tree? We cultivate our spiritual life a lot like we cultivate a garden or a farm, right? And the same way we cultivate our spiritual life, the same way that we cultivate a business or a marriage for that matter. We don't throw seeds one day on the ground and then fruit and vegetables will happen on the next day. It doesn't happen like that. I wish. That'd be cool. But it doesn't work like that. No, we plow, we water, we weed, we fertilize. We, we don't wake up one day to find that we no longer love God. Just like we don't wake up one day and we realize that we have a failing business. We we'll wake up one day and we realize my marriage is horrible. It doesn't work like that. These things happen over time. We find that whatever attention that we have invested in the farm will yield its fruit in due season. Likewise, we find that if we are neglectful, that too will show over time. So the question is, how do we cultivate the word of God in our hearts? Well, we look to the Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. It's a beautiful verse. It says, to keep, our, uh, to keep guarding our hearts. It says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. Guard your heart. This is the primary focus of orthodox spirituality. Guarding your heart, guarding the senses. Parents are very careful, I hope, about what your kids watch on the screens, no matter what screen it is, whether it's TV or, or these kind of things. We're very careful about what they watch. The question for the parents, are we as careful about what we see and what we hear in the movies? and in television, and in shows, and in music, and books, and websites, and screens, and all these things. If you don't get in the habit of guarding your senses, all the fasting, all the prayers, all the vigils won't produce fruit, I'm sorry to say. But if we start with a, a pure heart, then we have a good foundation 
and good soil, and it can bear fruit. And so one of the points I want to focus heavily on today is the seed. The seed. Our Lord tells us that the seed in the parable today, and what we're going to hear next Sunday as well, is in fact the word of God. It forces us to ask the question, where is the seed for the soil of my heart? Where is the seed? Before we can begin to think about our response to the seed or the condition of the soil, we have to think about whether or not there's even seed present. If a farmer is brought to a field and looks at a field and sees nothing but dirt, may come up with a few theories as why there's no crops that have grown on that particular location. He may think that the crops didn't get enough rain, or maybe they received too much sun, or there's a possibility that there was simply a lack of seed in that particular place. How does this apply to each one of us? In the world of farming, it is possible to have a bad batch of seed, sure. Seeds that don't necessarily produce meaningful vegetation and growth. Sure, that's fine. But the word of God is not like that. The word of God is always good seed. The question is, how do we make sure that we are receiving the seed of the word of God? If we think about it, we are receiving many kinds of seed. We find a lot of seeds that enter our hearts and our minds, and they actually begin to take root there in those places. We have the seeds of idolatry, the seed of lust, the seed of pride, the seed of anger. We have all these seeds that are competing for our space in our hearts, to take root in our hearts. We have seeds of competing worldviews and ideologies and things like that. We receive all these th seeds through all the sources that we engage in. All the TV, all the stuff that we listen to, all the social media that we consume, especially social media during a political cycle and things like that. It's as if we're asking ourselves to receive poisonous seeds, poisonous plants, hoping that it'll take root and bear good fruit. It's impossible. All the media, all the literature, all the music are types of seed. They all have an impact on our hearts and our minds. All of them do. But they are not all necessarily seeds that can produce good fruit. Our heart is the vessel that holds God. Are we guarding it? Are we guarding it? Is it a holy place that's reserved for God and for God alone? Bad seed can never produce good fruit. To produce good fruit, we need good seed. And only the word of God is truly good seed. When we speak of the word of God, we're speaking of the scripture itself. And we can also be speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. To receive the seed, we need to have multiple points of contact with the Holy Scripture and with our Lord himself. The more seed that we receive, the better chance that some of that seed might take root and grow strong and become trees that overflow with wonderful holy fruit. This is why we encourage people to come to liturgy as much as possible. It's not a checklist item. I came once this week, I don't have to go on Sunday. No, we take as much seed as possible, as much as possible. We've talked about daily readings. Maybe you've discussed this with your father confession. But the truth is, is that if you want a chance to really grow in the faith and to bear good fruit, it takes more than five minutes of daily reading. We need to prioritize the word of God in our lives. And if we're negligent, then I'm sorry to say, we have no excuses before God. It's our choice. He will say to us, 
Why didn't you put my word before fallen men? Why didn't you put my word before your movies and TV shows? Why didn't you put my word before your literature or your arts or your games or your businesses? Sometimes we fall into the temptation to to call God the dreadful judge. And I'm sorry to say that we will be filled with dread if we have ignored his word and we have not prioritized appropriately. One of the saints called the word of God a letter of love from God to each one of us. When you receive a letter from a friend or a dear loved one, you hurry to open it. This has happened with the kids lately. Because I know all of us, we send an email and text messages and stuff like that. But with the kids, when they receive a letter from their cousins or something like that, they, they run to open it. They're so excited to see their name on the envelope. They want to read it, open it quickly, absorb it, to take every single word of it. And then they want to reply. And they want to continue the conversation. We go through a lot of stamps in the house. Do we feel this way about the Bible that sits on our nightstand or on our bookshelf? Do we hunger and thirst to hear what God has to say to each one of us every single day? Do we treat God like we treat a friend or a dear loved one. Ultimately, it's not about God needing our attention. It's about man needing God's attention and instruction. When when our Lord was being tempted and fasted for 40 days, and Satan tempted him to make the stones into bread to relieve his hunger, Our Lord responded with scripture. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is what man shall live by. He was hungry to an extreme state, yet his true hunger was for the word of his father. The Lord's earthly life was rich with good and life-giving fruit, and it shouldn't surprise us because he had eagerly received the seed through study and contemplation through God's word. Another point that I want to go a bit deeper into is what happens to the word of God once it has entered into our hearts? Does it find a safe and fertile environment for growth? Or does the seed of the word of God encounter soil that has not been softened? That has not been cleared of weeds and thorns? We can say that all the Christian journey, the life of a Christian, can be boiled down to this parable. What do we do with the word of God? That's the parable in a nutshell. What do we do with the word of God? Our Lord tells us that everyone must fall into one of these categories that he's laid out for us, that we mentioned earlier. We may gain a lot lot by asking ourselves, well, which type of soil is in my heart? That self-reflection is really important. And if we don't answer it honestly, or we might be worried about the answer, we won't be able to properly address the problems and the shortcomings that we might find. It would be like meeting a doctor when you happen to feel sick, and then when the doctor says, how are you feeling? You reply, I'm fine. I'm good. Because you're kind of worried about the treatment. It might be uncomfortable. There might be some sacrifice. Well, if we're worried about the treatment, how can we ever be made well? If we're not going to, if we if we are going to worry, we ought to worry not about the treatment, but about what will happen if our illness goes untreated. That's the problem. The treatment might be uncomfortable for a moment. But if the illness spreads, then we have a big problem. Each of the soil in our Lord's parable offers us a type of person 
a type of faith. If your faith is only as good as your situation, that faith is destined to fail you because it is not based on Christ, who is our only rock and shelter in this life. Instead of, of being based on situations and circumstances in life, how can we honestly assess where we are and how can we move in the right direction towards Christ? We have to ask ourselves honestly, what or who do I love? And how we know the honest answer to the question. One way is to examine your schedule and examine your budget. Take a good look at those two things. Perhaps there is no greater indicator of what we love than the way that we spend our time and the way that we spend our financial resources. Take some time and reflect on these matters and if possible, adjust them. Hopefully with the guidance of your father confession so that you spend more time and more energy focused on God and the things of God. You will never waste any of your effort or energy in your life focused in this way because you will be investing in the garden of your heart and this will bring forth divine precious fruit from God. Unlike the stock market and investments of this world, this investment carries very, very little risk but many rewards. If you love God, spend time with him, both at home and at church, the same way as a man should act towards a wife who claims who he claims that he loves. Or to a woman who should act towards her kids who she claims to love. Love is not merely a word but an activity of one's presence. If we love God and the things of God, we should look at our budget and examine it. We should find ways to trim our budgets of things that are unnecessary, unprofitable, things that don't really go towards my spiritual life, things that don't go towards my relationship with our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. We should then redirect those funds towards tithing if we're not. Tithing and almsgiving, giving to the poor, not at a sense of guilt, but at a de deep sense of gratitude for all that God has given us. And as a testament to the fact that we understand that God is the source of all of our blessings, even life itself not to be attached to the things of this world, to give freely. A lot of the fights that happen at home are centered around money. This is a mechanism of the church to, to detach from that. Detach from money. When we examine our lives in this way, we will no doubt find things that we can change, and those things can help us transform our hearts from being unsuitable soil from being ex exceedingly fertile. So to conclude, God wants us to bear fruit. He wants us to be an oasis in the midst of the society, which is like a barren desert. He wants the hungry and the thirsty to flock to us and to be nourished and to be fed by us. Before we become an oasis for a garden or a garden, we have to ask, where is the seed? Where is the seed? God, out of his love, has given us his word as seed, as potential. It is our disciplines that remove the thorns and it's our act of love and charity that helped fertilize the seed of God in our hearts. And then something beautiful happens. The seed of the word 
moves by grace from potential to actual fruit. It's a miracle that happens. The seed finds its purpose fulfilled when it finds a good place to dwell within each one of us. And this doesn't happen overnight. Much like any successful harvest, it takes diligence and patience and perseverance. But God's promises are true. He is honest with his promises. May God give us that determination, that perseverance, to search for the life-giving seed of his word. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Bless.